Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you on this January morning. Yeah. Uh, delightful, delight, de, delighted to be with you in this season of Epiphany as we continue to follow Jesus in his initial beginnings of his, uh, his ministry. He, it's interesting of the prophecies that have been fulfilled mm -hmm. to this point. And uh, John, we're going to see John has been arrested and Jesus begins his ministry. But also we find in this that Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy that we're going to take a look at out of uh, Isaiah. Right. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get to that. Uh, how about we begin with the collect of the day? Absolutely. Okay. All right, we pray. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right, we will begin <clears throat> in uh, Isaiah. Uh, we're in chapter 9. Mm -hmm. uh, the first four verses of, uh, of uh, this chapter, so... I'll go ahead and read it here. It says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. All right. Now, the intro to this is an interesting kind of thing. The, he says, but there will be no gloom. And it's kind of found, it's very informative back in chapter 8 right. of the gloom. And one of the most striking things in this chapter that, uh, that testifies to why they were in gloom. And it's an interesting thing here where uh, back in chapter 8, um, and... Isaiah starts in verse 11, and he says, The strong hand of the Lord was upon me as he spoke to me. He says, Do not walk in the way of this people. And then he says, Don't call things the way they call them. Mm -hmm. Don't do any of that. But he says, Bind up the testimony, seal it, the teaching, uh, uh, teaching among my disciples. And so what he's saying is, you know, don't, don't let the prophecy, don't let my word give way yeah. to this. But here's the thing. When he says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwell on Mount Zion. So what Isaiah is saying is he and the faithful, they're a message to the people of Israel that God is still with them. Now this is what's interesting. And when they say to you, Inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Now this is what's interesting. To the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, the word of the Lord, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry, and when they are hungry they will be enraged, and they will speak contemptuously against their king, and their God, and they will turn their faces upward. They will look to the earth, but behold distress and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Now what's fascinating here is the reason there's gloom, I like the image, he says, they have no dawn, I have no future. Right. They have no hope that light is going to come. And because they have no hope that light's going to come, they turn further into the darkness, which, and, and one of the things I, I kind of studied between this and the darkness idea is, it's, it's a fascinating thing. 
we tried eight ways to Sunday to describe what darkness looks like. But a simple understanding of darkness is godlessness. Mm -hmm. Sin is darkness. Why? Because it's an act of which God has no part. Okay? Mm -hmm. So darkness here is godlessness. In other words, they do not see or know or are aware of anything according to God, and therefore that's only according to their imagination. To what, to, and he talks about necromancers, to what Satan would reveal to them. Okay? And the problem is, is that, is, is like he, I, I, it's a fascinating thing. It says that they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And then they're going to become enraged because nothing, the godlessness is offering nothing that satisfies the soul or the life. They just de dealing with the consequence of sin, the perishing. And so for them, one of the most fascinating things is that they'll speak contemptuously against the king because civil government is failing them. It's failing to do what it promised. Mm -hmm. We run into that in our country today. But then they will also speak against God who put the king in place. Yeah. And so forth. Now what's fascinating is they turn their face upwards. And I saw this understood two ways. One is arrogant pride. The idea of the upturned face. You know, that, yeah. that arrogance and so forth. At the same time, it also was explained that this is they reach a point that they begin looking elsewhere. Now, the problem I have with that it's they're looking for God is it says, and they will look to the earth. They do not look up mm. to God, but it says they look to the earth. And then they treat the earth as its as mother, as the thing that will save them, as the thing. And the, the problem is, is the earth has no power apart from the Lord's giving. Right. And that's when they enter into the darkness and the str distress only becomes... A thick darkness, which means, and I, it was interesting, when you think of darkness and it being thick and so forth, it's, a, it's an interesting image because you might think of it in terms of, of uh, like, shades of darkness. Yeah. Thick darkness would be yeah. thicker. But the concept of thick <clears throat> being put with the darkness was an understanding that there's no way to make, it, make way through it. Mm -hmm. It's like... You're, 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 you're distressing it. And so this, what they have is nothing but gloom. And that idea of gloom is that nothing will be better. And nothing, not, they're left with nothing and so forth. And I thought that it was interesting, one of the authors I think I read said that this concept of gloom echoes the, uh, the experience of those in hell as reflected in the rich man and mm. his agony there. Yeah. Because it's a place of godlessness. And they're in utter despair. But then he, he points out here that nine comes in there. But in contradistinction to those who have no light, there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. Okay? And he talks about that the Lord gave them up to that in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. Okay, and one of the things that, why these two regions, they're the northernmost parts. Whenever you hear like uh, Jesus preached in Tyre and Sidon, these are in the region of Asherah. They're the very northernmost end along, when you think of the Mediterranean, they're in the most northern part. Well, when invading armies came in mass, they always came through the north first. They would be probing, come in in that area, and it's the farthest from the religious center of Israel, which is down in Jerusalem. Yeah. And so they were constantly inundated by, you know, the rod of the oppressors, tiglath Pileser, when he came through, but they were the first to fall away, too, and so forth. And so what he's saying here is, you were the first to fall away, you're going to be the first to see the light. And we see that echoed then mm -hmm. in the gospel proper. Right. But see, what he's saying is, uh, he talks about, uh, but in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea. And then he points out there in verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. And light is always the emphasis of God's entering the darkness. Yeah. 
It's, it's, and so in other words, what the prophecy is, it's like the dawn. Mm -hmm. The coming of Christ is the sunrise. I guess I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, but. and I, I think about it in terms of, of our Christmas Day gospel lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, the, that John 1 passage for the, the, uh, the light came into the darkness and the darkness did not overwhelm it, did not contain it. Right, And right. this is the foretelling of that in a way. That this is those who are in darkness, on them has Christ shown his light. And especially when you look at the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles. It's not bound to a specific region, but it is for all people. Uh, I have a slight change in the translation. Good. It just says the, the nations, uh, which it's the same word in, in Hebrew, just kind of is how they, they translate it differently, uh, which I have the ESV, so that's... No, but is, is it in the Hebrew, is nations ethne, the, the idea of the ethnic, or the idea of the, the other... Ethnicities, the other name is that how the Hebrew does that? Um, so it's goyim, which okay. kind of just means non-Jews. Okay, it, yeah. it's always how I've always been and, been taught. That's and I the, think the Greek they use called the ethne, the, ethne. The, the the other ethnics that, and that makes sense because if you're differentiating mm -hmm. one group of people from another, it would be the ethnes and so right. on. And as a rule, nations were built around an ethic or and and their their uniqueness to their mm -hmm. culture or their their uh, their origins and so forth. That's interesting. Uh, that, uh, but it, it's a fascinating thing that uh, you. And he talks about in here, uh, dwelt in the land of deep darkness. On them light has shined. And it. I always think of that in Psalm eighteen. I think it's verse thirty-two. It is you, O Lord, who light my lamp. Uh, you. Uh, I got to say it the rest of it. You enlighten my darkness. And one of the things that I find fascinating, and that may be where I go in my sermon, and I may start with that particular verse, but what it is, is I love how the confession is there that I got a lamp, yeah, but I can't light it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got that. The other thing I got is darkness. I have godlessness. I'm born that way. Yeah. Okay, and yet you, you uh, God my godlessness. But you come in yeah. here, that, that light, and that's, yeah. that, that's the whole idea of the clash is when he says light has entered the darkness is God has entered the godlessness. It's almost like a lighthouse on the shore. The darkness of the, the, the bay around the lighthouse is all-encompassing. Mm -hmm. you know, even on a, a full moon night, it's still pitch black most yeah. of the time. And then you have this light that is shining and is the, the beacon, is the guide, is the direction to safety. Um, well, and I, I guess I don't know, and I'm going to challenge you okay. on that. Because the one thing that's emphasized in this is it's not you come to the light, but the light has come to you. Light entered the darkness. Yeah. Okay, I get what you're saying. A as we live in the darkness, mm -hmm. we live by the light. Right. Yes, yeah. yes. But this is talking about the entrance of God mm -hmm. into. And what's interesting is in the John passage, remember it says, you were talking about how uh, light entered the darkness and the darkness had not overcome it. But one of the things he talks about in there is that basically because people love darkness rather than light, lest their sins or they be exposed. Right. And one of the fascinating things is what, what would be exposed about them? It what would be exposed is that they're, they're godless. They are without God. Mm -hmm. What they didn't get is they assume if God's coming into their godlessness, he's there to condemn and kill them for their godlessness. Okay, But what they don't get is this light that has entered in, yes, you see God, not as the God who kills the godless, but the God who has come to save the godless by being treated as the godless on the cross in the darkness. Yeah. Because he becomes sin, he becomes the darkness mm -hmm. to save and so forth. And so it's an interesting thing to, to understand that he's coming to save. Because everything, it's to those who were in anguish. Okay, I, I just love this. Because what he's saying is, is that if you're in anguish, he's not coming to punish you because you're there. He's coming to change things up. Right. It is it is a proclamation, like the dawn idea. Well, I see the dawn, more light's coming. And that's what his prophecy is, yeah. is, is even the godless, there's a dawn for them. 
And if there's a dawn for them in this promise, then there is a God coming not to kill, but to save. One of the resources I was reading, it made this observation that this is the, the, perfect, the perfect time of year for this, um, for this lesson to occur. Mm-hmm. We are in the days past the winter solstice, so the days are getting longer. Mm-hmm. And we are heading towards the time where we will have more and more dawn, more and more light. Yeah. As we we may not feel that because it feels like the sun sets at three p.m. sometimes and doesn't actually get up until noon. Right. But it is getting brighter. The sure. the light the light is shining on us longer. And you taking that as a metaphor for this pa- or the uh, the way that the the people hearing this passage, uh, both Isaiah's initial audience and us, that you know we feel separated we feel like we are in the darkness and the darkness is all encompassing but the dawn is coming there is that promise of of light to come yeah and and with the dawn the day must follow yeah you know and and so forth and one of the other things that is interesting here the last verse for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder the rod of his oppressor this is of course where where uh uh, the tiglath Pileser, the, the, the nations that came in had been thrown off. But the interesting part is the last line. He says, you have broken as on the day of Midian, the rod of the oppressor, you broke it as you did on the day of Midian. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I was reading on this I find fascinating is that the day of Midian happened during the time of judges. And this is a way of letting them know no king is going to do this. No earthly king will do this. Just as God delivered the people through Gideon on the day when they went down, it will be it will be God who will break the rod of darkness, the rod of sin. But what is interesting, though, is that God will do this with the weapons of weakness, I was the, say, the, I, the jars, yeah. and stuff like that. And that's Jesus. You know, the, He saves by weakness, and it's totally it's saved totally by him if you understand what i mean and the interesting thing when it says uh, the shout for you know when you shout for the lord and for gideon that would that they would call out and so forth and here you have jesus is for the people yeah father forgive yeah. them and so forth but uh, but i we often miss that idea but it was uh, really interesting that they should put their hope in no earthly king yeah because this is going to happen Solely by the work of God. Yeah. I was I was wondering because, um, like you said, that it's the the defeat of Midian is by the breaking of the the glass or the clay jars around the lamps or around the torches. Excuse me. That that shine then and, and the, yeah the and light the light comes in, and in the case of uh, Gideon and Midian. The light creates confusion on for the ungodly. Well, and the horns, yeah, and the, the horns, of the yeah, horns, the, yeah, the blowing yeah. of the horns as yeah, well. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, just covering that with the fifth graders in uh, in Sunday school last week, it was a, a fresh image. Um, but you know, you wonder would what the connection that would have been made um, to that would have been. You know, would I mean, we can assume that uh, that they would hear the same things that we're hearing that it's the light shining in and oh, this is the promise of deliverance from this oppressive ruler. Mm -hmm. This uh, godless ruler, yep. Either Satan who (laughs) oppresses on on us or or Midian who oppressed the the Israelites in days of old. By the light of God are they defeated. Right. Well, and see, the interesting part is, is up above the Lord says that it's he who caused the darkness to come because of their godlessness. Then they would get to the point where they would hunger for God, for the light. They were looking for something. They were ready for it. So also at the raising of Gideon, the Midianites had been, because the the people had fallen away and become godless in their living, God sent the Midianites in, and then he raises him up to deliver and so forth. But it's it's just, I think the, the interesting part is the, people hearing this, that idea of, of Gideon and the deliverance that happened, that's a story they know because it defines them. 
Yeah. That this was done for them. So they would know that story. So right away they hear, they have to go back, yeah, what happened at Midian? Wait a minute, there were no kings then. Yeah. You know, and it was the time of judges, and I find it, again, a, a fascinating image that fits. But I think they would take it away probably pretty well with that. But Yeah, and that's one of those things that uh, <coughs> the, the references to Israelite history through the, the prophets today that God uses uh, the history of his people to tell the future of his people in, uh, in various ways and it's just such a, a, a neat way that it, it all connects together. You gave me an image um, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before and it's, it's on my bulletin board it's the uh, all of the, the cross references in scripture oh, yeah, yeah. and it, you, can't, you can't read the image because there's t there's so many lines bouncing back and forth, but it's a, a good reminder that those uh, if you're looking at your Lutheran Study Bible or I've got it pulled up here, there's a lot of uh, uh, letters and numbers in your verse that reference other things. Backward Follow and through yeah. on some of those every now and then, and you can just go down these rabbit holes of oh that's what that's and then that goes here, and then you click on that reference, and then you've got a whole other list of references, but it's the the connectedness of God's love and God's story for his people that does not change or, or waver. Yeah, yeah. And see, I, it, yeah, it, it is a fascinating thing. So, well, let's take a look at the fulfillment of this prophecy in uh, Matthew's Gospel. We had to... Uh, here, Matthew chapter 4, and what we're going to pick up with is verse 12. This is the beginning of his ministry, so you want to... So go 12 uh, through uh, uh, tw 25. The end of chapter, yeah, okay. 25, yep. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them has a light shined. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and for, from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Okay. Now what's interesting is this looks like it first locates him. He gets his GPS on where he's right. at. You know where there, and then he starts setting up business. Okay, I need to hire some people, so mm -hmm. he calls, and then he proceeds then not to employ them, but to have them follow him while he gets to work doing yeah. what uh, what he what came to do. But it's just a an interesting yeah. GPS moment here. And go ahead. Go I, ahead. I was reading um, one of the things I was reading was said that there's three different ways to emphasize this passage you have jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecy in that first portion you have uh, jesus as the one who calls the disciples and, and are three different uh locations for your sermon to go is the jesus fulfills the prophecy jesus calls the disciples and jesus the great physician and all three of these are great things that are in this text and it's one of those those moments where I, we've talked about this before, where you look at a text and you go, okay, I only can preach one sermon on this text at this time, so which one is it going to be? But you see these three different things all here that all connect together, though. Uh, I think that's the beauty of it, is it's not just random passages that are thrown together, but these are, are cohesive stories. Uh, this is a cohesive uh, 
story of the life of, of Christ. Right. There's a lot of chronology in this, of, yeah. of the sequencing and, and so forth. Now, one of the things that is interesting in this, it's now, it's after John has been imprisoned and so forth. It says he withdrew to Galilee, and then he, you know, he went and lived in Capernaum. And now what's interesting is his withdrawal from uh, Galilee, or from Nazareth specifically, uh, is not so much as, oh, I'm afraid that they'll come and get me like they did John. Because that, that's not a concern. John was not abducted in Nazareth. That was much further south, if you will. But what I read on, I thought this was kind of interesting, is why would he choose to locate in, in Capernaum? I mean, there's all these regions in, in this, if Naf Naphtali and, and uh, Zebulun and so forth, why there? It's not the why there, but why did he leave Nazareth? One of the authors contended that this is post his first preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth. And he said, it's fulfilled in your hearing. And they took him out and we're going to throw him off the precipice. And so he leaves. I gave you your shot. I'm moving on. And he moves on to here. But the other thing that was an interesting challenge to it is there's no way on earth Anyone in Judaism would expect the Messiah to set up business in the the most corrupt backwater place yeah. as he does. They're looking for him in Jerusalem. Just like when the wise men come, they expect Jesus to be born in Jerusalem. No, it's down here in Bethlehem. Well, why Bethlehem? Well, because God said, you know, though you're least, this is where you're going to come. And this as well is... God has a plan for how he'll carry out that ministry and where he'll do it. And so this is a fulfilling of what God promised. And that's fascinating because it's a place the longest in darkness receives the most of Jesus' active ministry yeah. here and so forth. So it's, it's an interesting thing, but it's the fulfilling of that um, and, and the like. So as you hear the cities of Caesarea Philippi, and like I mentioned, Tyre and Sidon, all of these are a part of that region that was bordered with Syria and the like. But uh, again, the idea of light and darkness or contrast here, the land that uh, was dwelling in darkness. Now, it used to be the old translation, I think, read was, uh, the, that sat in darkness. And I thought that was an interesting thing because it was literally they could not come out of the darkness, but they're dwelling in it. Yeah. It's it's kind of like that's where they set up home. Yeah. Well, the the sat in darkness. It reminds me of Psalm one. Blessed is the man who does not uh, walk in the way of of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers, or no stand, or stand in, in the way of. Oh gosh, I've tripped up over. But the the idea being the no, no, the, I, the progression of the stationary uh, behavior. Yeah. Uh, who no, walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And that's interesting because that's pretty much what they had come to be. Remember, Because right. even in 8, it talked about how that they would rebel against or mock not only the rulers, but God himself, scoffers. They'd become mm -hmm. scoffers at that point. So yeah, that's that's a really the, good connection to that. The, the increasing stationariness in the ungodly behavior in the, the, the darkness, yeah. I think is a, a cool image to, to see here. And then as we see, God comes into the darkness. Now, one of the things that I thought was a fascinating observation is that uh, this transition, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, and then it calls him the way of the sea. Now, one of the authors I read, I thought it was interesting, is when Christ comes, ethnicities disappear. There is no Asher or Zebulun or Naphtali. There is only the way that the Lord has made. There is only Christian. There is only the followers of Christ. I thought that was one. Of the, I never thought about that before. But see, they would not. They would not know it as the way of the sea. Right. The other cultures would. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just a fascinating. Uh, I, I just I thought that was an interesting point that and that's a great thing that ties into the the lesson we won't cover today our epistle lesson where um, where Paul says you know some of you say that you follow this you follow Apollos I follow Paul are are not all one in Christ now he's talking about literal camps within the church right but it's the same idea that there is 
nothing other than unity found in Christ. Right, right. Yeah, and that's that's so much put there. But then again, the light has dawned. Christ has come, and uh, he is he is there with them. The interesting thing, though, is he picks up the exact same ministry message that John takes on. And he says, repent for the kingdom of God, and this is a facet, is at hand. John, I believe, said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Jesus is letting them know it's arrived. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I find fascinating with this, and I think it literally, it, it, this verse, 17, is involved in the calling to yeah. follow. For this reason, is when we are called by the Lord and brought into his discipleship, we are, we are as a disciple, we are baptized and born again to follow on where he leads and in his ways. The temptation will always be to turn to and follow other ways, or to turn to godlessness, mm -hmm. which you see Peter down the road doing. Right. He's following Jesus right to the point to saying, you are the Christ, the son of, you know, and yeah. so forth. But then he immediately Don't flips go to back that. to the darkness, or the godlessness, as he, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, mm -hmm. and so forth. And it's a, it's it's an interesting, because, and I love that, he says, you have your mind set on the things of, of the earth and not the things of men. And it goes back to the Old Testament where it's like, so they set their minds or they set look to the earth and it uh, just that yeah. contrast but this idea of for the only way they could follow jesus was by daily repentance turning to the kingdom turning away from what they thought you know even even turning away from their professions yeah there's nothing wrong with their professions but there had to be this constant turning and again and again how many times did jesus have to bring them to repentance because they would go down this and it's what he's talking about is this, the, to be in the kingdom, to follow in the kingdom, it always is going to revolve, in, involve as sinners that turning. And it's like Luther's thing. Why do I need to hear the gospel? Why do I need to repent every day? Because I keep sinning every yeah. day. You know, the darkness, we're in the darkness. We're not of the darkness. And the darkness always seems, the godless ways seem easier or... You know, a little, yeah. a little more so, and that's the idea of the repentance. You know, that let us daily die to sin and let us daily rise with Him. Uh, I was talking about repentance with the third graders uh, this morning. I went and did my memory visit, and our memory verse is not this specific verse, but it, uh, from uh, another passage where Jesus uh, says the same message and explaining to them this is what repentance uh, means: is to do a complete one eighty. Mm -hmm. and you could just see kind of, oh, oh, that's what that word that we say all the time actually means. But it's a good reminder for us as well that it's that daily repentance, the daily, I know that I'm not going to go the way that God wants me to go, and I need to, to, trust, in, in, right. to, to, to trust in him and follow what he has, has said for us. But, and, and while it's a 180, the one thing I, I love, uh, uh, I'd heard one time, is sometimes it's only a 90 degree turn. It's how far you have turned away from the Lord. Because you're not just turning around, you are turning to the Lord. But it always involves that turn or change. Because if you're off one degree, you're still not with the Lord. Right. And, and that turning idea manifests itself in that needing to happen. Now, see, the thing that I find here is, is this idea of darkness. Okay? Mm -hmm. Even calling these men away from their nets... That was how the way of life they had, and it's not that fishing's godless, but the interesting part is, is they were going to learn how to walk in the presence of the light, yeah. as opposed to the presence of the darkness. And then when he talks about going throughout Galilee, whether it's by teaching or preaching or healing, proclaiming, it's an interesting thing that Teaching and preaching, he keeps putting God in the midst of godlessness. Mm -hmm. And every disease is bringing God into the godless curse of sin and what it does to the body. Right. And see, it's, it's, each of these are occasions when godlessness is invaded by God himself. And doesn't he, not only does he invade it, 
but he doesn't deal with them according to the darkness that's found. He literally frees them from the darkness or the signs of godlessness. It's an, it's an interesting thing in this, and the, uh, I love the, the description of all the various types of darkness that people were experiencing. Yeah. And one of the authors said, you know, this looks like something Luke, as a physician, yeah. would write, yeah. <laughs> and so forth. But uh, Matthew, you know, the Holy Spirit has Matthew, you know, identify all these various ways in which people were experiencing darkness. Yeah. You know, the, the, what, it, what is life without God? Right. And so forth. But um, to the great uh, uh, crowd following him, and the interesting thing is, again, the word follow comes in. And I read an interesting thing, but in many ways what he's staging here is what we hear in chapter 5, which yeah. is the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. It's, it's, in, it's not really, but they, I thought it was an interesting way they said that a lot of this work and stuff like that is all Jesus setting the stage for the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. No, and that's uh, not that anything before the Sermon on the Mount is insignificant, but no. it... Uh -huh. it, it you, you got to have that before you get there so that the ears can hear. Well, and see, because he's saying that the crowds, great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And it says, and seeing the crowd, he yeah. turns around. And what's fascinating here is he starts, he starts shedding the light where everybody thought, only darkness would dwell. The poor, the mourn. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's just yeah. an interesting turn in the how that how that uh, the idea of doing that, and it's a fascinating thing when he talks about fishers of men. And the most fascinating thing with fishers of men, a fisherman always has a net or a line. And the most interesting thing is what Jesus will give these men to fish or to catch men is the light. Yeah. The light will be the net. The sermon is like a net cast into the sea. And the Holy Spirit will draw it in, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That that idea. And a fisherman always has his tackle. Right. We we tend to forget that because it shows him them fishermen with their tackle. Jesus says, "Follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men." Okay, fishers we know. But how are we going to catch them? Yeah. And that's what he'll show them. Mhm. Mm and stuff. He's going to give them the tackle uh, to to gather or yeah. to uh, catch people. And it, it almost again is kind of that subversion of the norm, like you said. the The tackle uh, is the light, and I am not a fisherman. I don't enjoy fishing, uh, but I know that you're not supposed to go fishing in the middle of the day because it's hot and the fish hide in the darkness. Right. And uh, it's almost the juxtaposition of you're shining the light. Right. And every every fisherman that I know is always, you know, no, you got to wear the red light. You know, the, the fish can't see that and all of those things. And it's the juxtaposition of, oh, we're shining the light into the 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 ocean uh, of the world. Um, but the light is the net. Yeah. It, it, it is the net that is is being thrown into the water <laughs> and so forth. And the most glorious part is when it hits the water, they hear the law. It's coming. But then the gospel draws them into the net and yeah. so forth. And I saw an interesting descriptive of what they did with the nets. I did not realize that the, the nets at that particular time kind of followed the way they've been used the world over. But as a rule, what they would do with the nets is like mending them and so forth, is yes, tying holes or whatever. But around the outer rim of the net and so forth, they basically had lead weights mm -hmm. sewed in. So when they threw it, they would go down and then, of course, cinch up and and pull those up as the the idea. So it, it's just an interesting, you know, when you think of, of the the word being the, the net and so forth, and you don't have to mend it and so forth, but, you know what I mean, just the, the handling of the net and, you know, preparing it for its preparation yeah. and stuff. That uh, It's kind of like we, when we do our sermon study, we're mending the net, if you will, getting it ready. Oh, yeah. Because mending doesn't necessarily mean repair. It's that mending could be simply you get it, folded the best way possible mm -hmm. to throw it out yeah. and stuff and uh, and the like. But uh, 
Again, this bearing witness, part of Jesus' epiphany, that he's revealing himself to be uh, the Son of God, come in the flesh, and so forth. And uh, it's, uh, like I say, uh, Andrew has already brought Simon Peter to Jesus, so he knows about him and stuff like that. And then he chooses him. And that's one other note here I thought was fascinating here is that... um, the fact that Matthew purposely identifies these men as fishermen in contradistinction to the educated, yeah. the prophets, and, and the like, uh, it, it's a really telling message that the kingdom and the way that it, it will come and so forth leans not on the reeds of man's wisdom or his knowledge, but upon the net that he provides, or the light that he provides, yeah. and so forth. And the other thing I thought was interesting, that one said, and to a degree he has to, but whenever somebody's converted or brought to faith, it involves deconstruction and construction. You have to deconstruct the things that your own sinful nature and the darkness put together about man, okay? And then you construct in its place the, the eternal work of God. And the most fascinating thing is you have the disciples who are learning from Jesus and they're having their own things deconstructed. But when you look at when the Pharisees and the like come against him, they have a totally different, a much bigger structure that has to be deconstructed and they're bent on protecting it Mm -hmm. and so forth. But uh, interesting, interesting call that I always say that it's what I was taught. A good friend, uh, Herb Miller, said, he goes, always remember God gifts those that he calls uh, and so forth. He doesn't so much call the gifted as he gifts those yeah. that he calls. And So it was an interesting thing. What they would need to be gifted with, clearly they did not have, and he would have to provide it. Mm-hmm. So, Any other thoughts on this one? No. I, it, like I said, it's, it's a, beautiful, uh, a beautiful text, and it's just the, the great text for this, epiphany season as, as we prepare to uh, shortly walk with our Lord on his journey to the cross, you know, the reminder of, of what has been done for us and, and this, the, the fulfillment of all the words written uh, about him. Here, Emmanuel dwells among us and, and takes what we cannot and, and completes what we cannot. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the interesting thing, those who, the, 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 I just it came to mind here in terms of uh, those who are dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and it all it always emphasizes that the cross is the place of darkness, and so forth. And there, the light is the voice of the Son of God. He's he's in there though it, though it be dark, but it's a it's a rich text. Do you know where you're going with yours? We, I'm I'm the the calling the the like you said kind of the gifting those that he calls uh, that kind of idea is is prevalent throughout my uh my sermon and and focusing on our calls uh not not you and i necessarily but the call of of all baptized who believe uh to be fishers of of men well and see these men already had the call to to baptism repentance Mm -hmm. they had heard that and then they had the greater call to something in terms of that and the most fascinating thing is it would always involve that repentant idea Mm -hmm. of uh, of that, so I'm not sure how I'm going to go with it. I just I I am very much attracted to understanding the nature of darkness and what it means to say that the light has has shined on those in the land of darkness, yeah. literally in the place of the godless and and so forth. And uh, it's just the idea of the the glory of Jesus born in the darkness. You know, Jesus dies in the darkness, Jesus is buried in the darkness, Jesus is risen in the darkness. All these great moments happen, you know, invading these places of darkness and so forth with with salvation. So I'm not sure, like I say, how I want to kind of come at that just yet, but uh, I just find it a fascinating thing. The background to the Isaiah passage is helpful because there are a lot of people who literally are, are, they have no dawn. I, I love that understanding that they have no sign of, of hope and so forth. So, uh, but uh, this is definitely, Isaiah's passage is one of hope. 
right. to people who can't find it. Mm -hmm. So, with that, uh, let's see, what do we have? Uh, we have voters meeting today after the late service. Hope you're able to make that. Uh, Coming this week, can you think of anything? Uh, this week we get to celebrate Lutheran Schools Week. That's true, it uh, is. Yeah, lots of things so, happening. Yeah. You got some pennies. I know we don't want to take them away from the LWML and their mites, but uh, the kids have penny wars during this week. And what they do is each class brings in pennies, nickels, dimes, whatever, to, uh, to raise money for, and we're using it for a Lutheran Heritage Foundation that provides all kinds of uh, Christian, biblical, Lutheran materials in count uh, over 90 languages mm -hmm. to missionaries free of charge and the kids are supporting that we have uh, Reverend Marshall coming next Sunday to bring that message and so forth but the penny wars is whichever class raises the most pennies and so forth well they get a party but this year we had unbeknownst to us <laughs> inserted that the class will get to pick one of the pastors who they will then get to throw a pie at. And we were told after the fact. Uh, <laughs> one of the things they're doing too, if you'd like to help, is they're gathering boxes of uh, breakfast cereal. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to drop some of those off, they're doing that. And then on the last day, they're going to do a big domino run of all the boxes. Uh, Tuesday is the domino. Oh, the, yeah, right, yeah, breakfast okay. cereal domino is on Tuesday. So uh, if you have your, uh, if you would like to contribute to that, Bring those uh, either Monday or Tuesday to the office. Yeah, yeah, and so forth. But uh, we'll, uh, it's just, and then all the money that's raised through the Penny Wars will actually be donated to uh, Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Uh, Reverend Marshall is going to be preaching our uh, morning chapel with the kids and talking about that. So that's uh, exciting things happening this week. Um, beyond that, uh, we have Bible study tomorrow night with uh, Pastor Clamola yeah. and Pastor Mapus, And then we have Wednesday morning. We're starting Chapter 2 of Hebrews. So uh, hope you'd like to come in and sit down with us. We're, we've got a good group and a good discussion. So, anything else? Not that I can think of. All righty. Well, God's blessings on your week ahead. I pray it's a, a blessed one and the light of the Lord is upon you. Absolutely. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.